All right. Hello, everyone. Um, we are live. I'm so excited uh, for this month's uh, webinar. Matt, how are you? It's good to see you. I'm very good, thank you. And thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much for being with us. I got to tell you, I have heard your podcast many times. I know this voice so well. And then I get to like come up with you. And this is phenomenal. Thank you. Um, Matt, I'm going to jump into like a little bit of an intro before we get into the topic of the day. Um, for anyone who does not know me um, or does not know Pillar, I'm Adisa Rodriguez and I lead operations in DEI here um, at Pillar. Um, Pillar is an interview intelligence platform that uses AI to help you run a more efficient interview process, analyze your interviews, train your team to be better interviewers, everything that has to do with the interview process. We are adding intelligence to. I am obviously so excited to be chatting with Matt today. Um, I'm fangirling. Um, Matt is, for those of you who do not know him, he's a jack of all trades when it comes to talent acquisition. He's a writer, he's a speaker, he's a consultant, a podcaster. I know him best as the producer and host of the Recruiting Future podcast, one of the world's leading podcasts on TA. We were just chatting and he, I, I think, well, I think I'm gonna get this right this time. He is on episode number 614 of the mm, Talent right. Podcast, <laughs> which yeah. to me is is when we do this monthly webinar and I'm like, you know, it takes work to do these. <laughs> it does. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So it is. It is awesome. Um, we are obviously the topic of the day is is AI. Is it the end of talent acquisition as we know it? But before we jump in there, Matt, we do ask our uh, our guests two questions at the beginning of our webinars every time. And so my first question for you is, why did you decide to build a career in talent acquisition? Um, I've just got two answers to this. The, the first answer is the same as a lot of other people, which is I just fell into it. Um, it wasn't something I planned. Um, yeah. The second, the second answer is probably more why I stayed in it than than why I was than I that I joined in the first place. And I've been in talent acquisition for a long time. I think that when recruiting works, you know, it can be magical in terms of the the outcomes for for everyone involved. And I have you know spent a very long time looking at what works in talent acquisition and what doesn't work in talent acquisition, the 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 role of technology to, to make things better and in some cases make things worse has, mm -hmm. has been interesting. Um, and I just think there's a lot of things still to fix to make talent acquisition consistently brilliant. And that's kind of really what um, has, has driven me to stay in this, um, you know, in this brilliant space. Yeah, yeah, I hear you on that. And the evolution of TA, it's like, con it just constantly changes with the changing of the market, changing of the labor force, changes in technology. Um, and I'm sure that you'll sh we'll speak to this today, but you know, I think that we're seeing one of the biggest shifts we've ever seen in talent acquisition right now, actively right now. Absolutely. Yeah, 100%. All right, second question, a little bit off topic, but what is one thing that people would surprise be surprised to know about you? You see, I'm quite transparent because I'm on the podcast all the time. So I really have to think about this one. Um, I think sometimes because I work a lot in technology, people presume I've got a technical background of some sort. Um, I've actually got a degree in drama. So I've got a degree in drama and acting, and, um, you know, which makes it, which, uh, yeah, and I'm a great advocate for for that kind of background in terms of going into business. But, um, but yeah, that was the that was the one thing that I thought of that I don't talk about very often. Oh, I'm, I am not surprised to hear that the podcast kind of, you can feel it in the podcast that you are, you sort of can have a performing side to you. Even, yeah, if, no, most, yes. even if you're able to like really host it for your guests. Yeah, no, it's, um, good. it's, uh, it's a great thing to do. Oh, I love that. Um, for uh, my grandmother, I was going to say, my grandmother was an actress. So I, I have a soft spot for people who are in, um, in the performing arts. 
All right, so before we jump in, everybody, I see that you guys are already sharing where you are dialing in from. Um, oh, I see. Oh, hi, Latom. Latom, it's good to see you. Um, the people from Toronto, Austin, Portland, Vancouver. We love to keep a really active chat um, during this com these conversations. Matt is a phenomenal person to just have this time with. And so this is about you guys, about our audience. Um, I have some planned questions and we will kind of drive the topic, but please drop in your questions, your comments, anything that you want to kind of understand and, and learn and know and dive into, please comment on there. I do watch the chat really closely. I will be bringing them into the conversation. Um, so that's number one. Number two is, uh, actually, that was it. That was my, oh, number two is polls. I always forget polls. Our head of marketing is going to kill me. Polls, you will see some polls come up throughout the webinar. Um, please answer them. It's how we get to kind of gauge where you guys are at, where you, how you're thinking about things. Um, and that's it. And with that said, there comes here comes one poll. Are you using any AI-related tools in your role? I just have a feeling this is going to be like 100% yes. Maybe not, but let's see. 82%. 82% yes. 18% no. All right. With that, we'll come back to that. 82%. We're still pretty high. 77%. Pretty much everyone is using some sort of AI-related tool in their role. We're going to dive into this in a minute. Uh, let me just set up the the topic of conversation, and then this is uh, we're going to lean into Matt Matt for uh, for most of this. The topic of today's conversation was inspired by Matt's um, keynote at the CIPD Recruitment and Retention Conference, where he talked about how AI might mean the end of talent acquisition as we know it. I also want to reference a quote from one of his recent white papers: "Ten ways AI will transform talent acquisition." This is a little bit of a spoiler, but I thought it was really important to kind of open this way. Um, with a widespread intelligent, with widespread intelligent automation and deep data insights, talent acquisition will only survive if it becomes a strategic function that can explicitly demonstrate its business value. Matt, with that, the first thing we're going to cover is how is that AI being used today? Tell me, kick us off. Let's get started. <clears throat> yeah, I think the the one thing to say is we have to be very clear about the way that AI is being used today is going to be very different from the way I, the AI is being used in the future. Because I sometimes see people talking about um, the tools that they have access to now and, you know, wondering out loud how they could ever replace lots of aspects of their, of their job. And I think we just need to be mindful of how quickly, how quickly things are, things are going to develop. Um, so, you know, it doesn't surprise me that um, so many people are using um, AI, AI already. That might be, uh, you know, tools that they've they're using themselves, large language models and things like that for writing. Um, obviously, AI is being baked into most of the software that we use on an everyday basis and most of the recruiting software um, that we use. And I think, you know, we can see it. We can see it sort of making an impact in a in a in a number of in a number of areas already. Um, you know, sourcing, for example, we're seeing kind of more automated sourcing, automated sourcing going on, um, candidate screening. I think it's really interesting to see some of the tools that are out there to really speed up the recruitment process and in so doing, making the candidate experience better, which I think is an absolutely critical thing that we need to consider as we as we sort of move move into this AI future, because there are. Mm -hmm. You know, there are some some kind of I suppose some some less less nice ways that it could that it could develop um, interviewing obviously um, that kind of goes without saying in uh, in terms of uh, the, the sort of things that that, that pillar do um, uh, candidate selection I think this is interesting because not as much as the um, the, the media and the regulators would have us would have everyone else believe. I think there's a lot of misconceptions <laughs> about. Um, I think that there's there's almost this public perception that as recruiters we have access to these amazing AI tools that just do everything for us, um, and that's obviously not the case at the moment. Um, and I think that most organisations still have a very very human input into um, into that candidate selection piece. And I think that's going to be interesting in terms of how that develops. 
um, a lot of the regulation that's coming in both in the US and from the EU is around that aspect of it. So mm -hmm. um, again, that's an interesting one to flag up. And then finally onboarding, um, I'm starting to see um, some interesting examples of automation and AI in onboarding. I had a podcast interview last week with uh, the chief people officer at Zapier, which is a, um, a tech company that specializes in automation. And they've actually built uh, an automated onboarding system that gives highly personalized um, content to people as, as they go through. And it's a great example of, I think when we talk about automation, there's always this fear that everything seems robotic and un, you know not personal when actually the absolute opposite can be the case. It's a, it, 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 they're tools that can help us to provide a very, very personalized experience and a very personalized journey at scale. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that was a great example of, of someone doing that. So a lot of things are already possible with the tools that we, that we, that we have now. And as things develop in the future, you know, OpenAI released another version of ChatGTP two days ago, which is already quicker. Um, Google made some announcements, <clears throat> excuse me, Google made some announcements a couple of days ago. Um, you know, the pace of change is speeding up. Of course, yeah. Um, and things, yeah, things are developing at a really fast clip. And, you know, I do want to get your your thoughts, maybe we can touch on this later, but on how, te how team members can keep up with how it's changing, how quickly it's changing as well. Um, mm -hmm. Matt, I wonder if you can dive a little deeper into, um, in particular, I'm hearing a lot of noise around the application process and the screening process and how that's how candidate applications are being impacted by or being used or candidates are using AI within the application process. Can you speak a little bit to that um, and how teams are reacting and mitigating? Yeah, um, I think this is probably the most, <clears throat> excuse me, my voice is going, all this talking. Um, I think this is probably... <laughs> This is probably the most important thing that we need to think about. So the, the thing about this technology is everyone has got it at the same time. So I think if you look at back, look back at some of the sort of other technological shifts that we've seen in talent acquisition, you know, the, 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 when the Internet turned up, when, uh, you know, mobiles turned up, social turned up, all these all these different things, um, you know, there was a there was an adoption period where you know, the, 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 these things kind of wrapped up. So, but everyone has access to this and it's not surprising that job applicants, candidates are using it to their advantage. Um, and I think the first um, implication of that, um, a number of them, actually most of the employers that I've spoken to in the last six months have seen, uh, you know, big increases in the number of applications that they've, that they've had to their roles. Mm -hmm. um, some of that might be about um, job markets and, and talent markets, but, um, you know, definitely... Um, a lot of it is it is people using AI in various ways to sort of speed up the speed up the process, and that's been particularly the case in college recruiting, where certainly in the UK, um, you know, applications for entry level um, grad jobs are up twenty percent, thirty percent because of AI. So, I think this has the um, the potential to break recruiting as we know it, um, <laughs> because I don't think our processes and systems are set up for it. And it's very easy to say, well, actually, you know, we should ban people from using this or we should it, adopt technology that spots this. But I think you have to take a step back and really ask whether that's the right thing to do. Firstly, as people come in to work for your organization, um, if they're going to stay any longer than 18 months, they're going to be using AI in their jobs all the time. So, um, you know, that's that's a that's a key factor. And also, should we really be getting to this tech arms race where the, the candidates have AI, we have AI to stop them, they get better AI, and it just, you know, it's kind of, it just, it just doesn't really help. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that we need to take a, a step back and really look at the recruiting process. And I think it's a great opportunity to, you know, make things better, more efficient, more effective, and perhaps lose some of the things that we've clung on to for for decades that actually aren't that useful when we sort of look at them, um, you know, look at look at them from a from a bit of a distance. So, um, yeah, I think I think this is the most significant the most significant part of all of this. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm hearing a lot about um, how, in order to mitigate the the incredibly like high volume of applications that are coming in, 
um, teams are considering adding more hurdles when we just went through this entire period of wanting to reduce the barriers to entry for applications for that process. And so, you know, how are you seeing hmm. teams strike that balance? Yeah, it's uh, um, yeah, it's kind of a dangerous time in terms of in terms of what happens. So I've I've seen a number of things. I've seen um, graduate employers come out and say we will not allow you to use AI in the application process. Which uh, how do they know? And I think also the thing is, if you think about what people are doing, using an AI on a resume or a cover letter, you don't really have enough data to spot that they've used AI on that, if that makes sense. We're talking about mm -hmm. small amounts of text here. So people putting policies out, banning it. Um, people trying to put more hurdles in place. And again, I think it's just part of that arms race where, um, you know, the, the, the technology will find, will find a way around it. Um, I think, you know, far more sensible, I've seen companies sort of adjust their process. They put things like video screening in, um, they've done it in a way that there there's still lots of humans in the in in the process if that makes sense but mm -hmm. um really sort of design their process in a way that they can uh, you know get back to candidates quickly candidate is easy for candidates to use and there are the checks and balances in there mm -hmm. that, you know, that 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 make sure um the right person's getting the job but i don't think anyone's really um really cracked it at the moment um, right. and i think it's going to be it's going to be really important over the next sort of six months to 12 months to see how companies react to that and what the what the right thing to do is but everything i've seen so far would would warn me against making things more difficult just to pe put people off applying because i don't think that's a long-term solution and uh, again i think it's, a, it's an opportunity to to use technology to mm -hmm. really the way that you do you do recruiting right 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 you kind of want candidates that are a little bit more like creative anyway you know and are able to use kind of technology too you know yeah exactly i mean it reminds me it, it reminds it's a bit like using calculators <laughs> you know like we need uh, yeah you know we need we need we need new skills we need new ways of assessing people and i i think that's why it's such a such a big turning point from from that perspective yeah, we have a couple comments in the chat I want to pull in. So Kathleen is mentioning, I agree that we shouldn't stop candidates from using AI, but rather stress the importance of using AI in an ethical manner, which Matt, you were uh, mentioning yeah. as well. Yeah, I think that's, an, that's a really important point because I think there's a difference between where someone's using AI as a tool to, you know, to, to, to enhance their application, if you like, and where someone's using it to actually explicitly cheat. So, mm -hmm. um, and I think it's understanding where that line is, is, is probably the, you know, the, the big debate. So to me, using AI to, you know, craft an application, uh, you know, rewrite something for you, that's not necessarily cheating. Um, using AI to send a digital doppelganger to an interview right. um, that, isn't, that isn't you and doesn't reflect <laughs> your true ability, that is cheating. And I think it's right. a it's a really good point. And where is that? Where is that line? Right. We have. Um, I think you just addressed this, but we had Leitom asking sort of the sentiment of employers on on candidates using AI to answer any of your questions. Um, there's there's a couple people mentioning that they use Pillar for the recording and the transcripts um, to automate the interview questions for job descriptions. Um, and then Kathleen's also mentioning that using AI to create your resume or cover letter is not entirely different from hiring an advisor to help, which we've been doing forever, right? Yeah, um, absolutely. You know, it's like in some ways that kind of thing. It's like, well, this is just a more advanced version of spell and grammar check. You could, you could mm -hmm. look at it like that. But I think it's a really interesting point. I think it's the um, it's where we need to have a proper debate. It's like, you know, what is actually, you know, what is what is kind of fair enough and expected, or what actually is someone misrepresenting their skills and their ability to do the job and and i think that's the that's the sort of key area to to think about right right i actually don't think i i just i misread Leighton's question so i don't think we actually answered it but i think he's asking what the sentiment of how he wants to know the sentiment of how employers view candidates using ai to answer interview questions not necessarily the resume but what are your thoughts on like when candidates go on you know video for an interview or something like that and they're using ai um to support them in the interview process yeah, I think that's a that's an interesting thing. Again, I was talking to uh, an employer um, 
for the for the podcast last week and they were they were having an issue that um they were having identical interview questions coming through and it was sort of obvious that um you know that something was something was going on and i think it's um yeah i mean i think it's a it's a tricky one because it's going to come down to it depends on the interview questions and i think that um do we need questions that um really are very personal and reflect that person's kind of skills, abilities and, and behaviours. So this is what I mean about rethinking the recruiting process. I think that there are questions that, um, you know, we may have asked regularly in interviews in the past that rely on structuring information in a certain way or recalling things that, um, you know, may not work moving forward. So I think, again, there is a conversation here around what type of interview questions are we going are we to ask to get a true picture of the the individual's ability to do that job and i think that perhaps we can see that as a good thing in terms of improving the quality of interviews and and the outputs of them so there are no easy answers to any of this i think that's the um you know that's the the big thing and that's why people really need to be paying attention to it thinking about it and and really sort of you know trying to plan for the plan mm-hmm. for the future here Okay, excellent. I'm going to pivot to a question that came in in our Q&A. Before I do, I'll share the comment from Liz. Liz said, the use of AI during a live video interview feels more like laziness than cheating. The whole point of an interview is to accurately describe your experience and skills. Why would AI know that better than the person themselves? Yeah, absolutely. I think that comes down, again, that comes down to the the, the types of questions that are, that are asked. Awesome. And then we have a question in our Q&A. Can Matt share which, this is a sort of pivot, can Matt share which aspects of TA processes he believes could or should be automated or leverage AI? Maybe even some recommendations on to- tools that are leading the way. Yeah, good question. Um, I think that there are some really obvious things that many people are already thinking about. You know, whether that's interview scheduling or you know whatever that um, you know whatever that might be, the, the admin side of things that can be um, that can be automated. Um, and perhaps the admin side of things that ATS has claimed that they could automate and have never been able to do. So um, <laughs> a, a kind of a general sort of improvement in efficiency, um, efficiency there. I think that, um, I think there's, again, there's a difference between what is, what it's uh, the capabilities of now and the capabilities of the future. So where I've seen some really interesting things, interesting things happen um, has been in um, high volume hiring where, um, speed mm-hmm. it is of the essence, and that's kind of driven um, a lot of automation. Um, you know, previously that might have been to deal with the volume of applicants, but coming out of the pandemic with the labour shortages that some of those sectors have seen, it's been based around speed. It's kind of like how can we get someone from um, you know contact you know contacting us to into a, into a job as quickly as possible? Um, and I think we've seen some really interesting um, automations from. Um, uh, companies like Paradox, for example, that springs to mind, um, who are kind of automating those those kind of initial conversations and that and that communication in a way that um, makes it quicker and better for everyone. So I think that's a, so automating that sort of that candidate communication. I think that's that's really interesting. Um, I've seen um, some assessment providers who are now able to provide um, automated personalized feedback at scale. Um, mm-hmm. which is interesting. Um, I think the actual process itself in terms of how things move around, there's a lot of automation that goes on there. Um, I think one of the things to one of the things that struck me a few weeks ago, um, I did a podcast interview with the chief people officer of um, a robotic process automating automation company. A robotic process automation is already being used a lot in finance departments and marketing departments to automate processes within within the enterprise. Um, and effectively, enterprises are looking at automation platforms that work across the entire enterprise. So um, it may be that there are elements of talent acquisition that get automated without our consent, for want of a better word. So I, I think anything that's kind of process driven, there's automation coming into it. Um, I think the, the the interesting line is when you talk to people about this, you always get an answer that says something like, Um, AI is going to automate all the dull, boring and repeatable parts of my job, and it's going to leave the interesting parts for me to do. And I think you just need to we need to dig down a little bit into that. It's like, what are the interesting parts and are they interesting to you, which is why you want to keep doing them? And 
can AI really not do those? So I think that um, moving forward, we might all be surprised by exactly what AI can automate. And I think mm -hmm. that's the sort of mindset that people need to bear in mind when they're thinking about thinking about these tools, thinking about these tools right now. Um, so as I say, it's kind of, you know, that that candidate communication automation and some of that process automation is what we're seeing at the moment. Um, it, you know, it may be that um, automation goes way further than than we currently think it is going to. And I think that's the, um, you know, that's the kind of real danger in terms of um, the way we think about it at the moment. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We've really seen a lot of demand on our on our end for automation within the product. One of the things that we introduced was around automating the development of guides. So you can automatically mm. create guides based on your job descriptions with Pillar now. And when you do that, you can obviously edit them and adjust them, but you're using interview you're using interview intelligence to develop the best guides that you can, right? Um, so, you know, that that whole thing, right now I'm seeing people use ChatGPT to put together their questions, but this is more personalized. And that's the whole point is like, how do you turn these tools into tools that help you be more personalized, help you be more human? um in the process yeah and i think that that also comes down to one of the things that we really need to think about is data so um you know everyone talks about chat gpt and gemini and all the other all the other ones but they're very general models um and you know we're seeing talent acquisition specific data. models emerging based on data and i think that one of the things to think about in your organization is is the data that you have and how how automation can tap into that, um, you know, and that may be through a, you know, maybe through a, a software provider like Pillar, or it might be something that you're sort of looking at internally yourself. So data is really the key here because that's what um, is going to make this, uh, you know, smart and intelligent and and make it work. Matt, I it is halfway through the podcast and we are still on topic one, so I'm gonna <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm gonna Just jump us. ahead. That's fine. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna, we're gonna drive forward. Um, I do want to get to the last topic around the future, um, but for now, let's just take a quick dive into the next topic, which is how is AI reshaping job roles? Um, we're going to put up a poll very quickly to get your pulse on this. What are your thoughts on how AI is reshaping job roles? Let's see, how are people answering? All right, we have... A good spread, a solid spread, mostly enhancing existing jobs or displacing jobs. That's where kind of people are living. Enhancing existing jobs is coming out at the top at the moment. All right, so let's get into it, Matt. How are how is AI reshaping job roles? Talk to us. Yeah, I think there's a there is a general amount of confusion about this. I think that um, you know the the World Economic Forum has been saying for several years that. Um, you know, legions of, of of jobs will be automated away, and we will lose we will lose jobs. Um, lots of people point to previous technical revolutions and the industrial revolution and say we're going to gain jobs. And I think we've already talked about um, you know enhancing enhancing jobs. So I think it's a bit difficult to call because I'm constantly seeing um, conflicting conflicting data around you know jobs lost and jobs gained and and all that sort of stuff. I think what we can what we can safely say though is it is going to change jobs. Um, now I'm of the view that actually you know AI will take a lot of jobs away, and I think that is a challenge for um, for governments and, and organisations. But I think that um, that's a point of view. But I think that we can we can say that AI will change jobs, and it will change you know more jobs than we than than, than, than we we would imagine. Um, and that will have an impact on the people who do those jobs because they, it might change their job into something that they don't want to do. They might not have the skills to do it. Um, you know, so I think there's some big, big implications there. Can you dive? So your point of view is that it will remove jobs. Can you dive a little bit deeper into that? What specific types of jobs? What are you seeing um, that sort of is pointing you in that direction? Yeah, so I think that... Um, you know, we're already seeing it with things like customer service um, that where that is some of that is being automated away. There are we're only a couple of technical advancements away from a lot of that being being automated away. So, um, you know, that that kind of thing is a um, is, is obvious. Um, I think also one of the one of the implications that, that someone pointed out to me the other day is, um, you know, in a lot of organizations, some of the jobs that AI is definitely automating away 
um, were previously entry level jobs where people joined the company and trained and became experienced. And I think there's a, um, you know, there's a there's a there's a real issue um, there to, to to think about. So um, I think there, you know, there, there are some of the examples. You know, customer service, sales, so, so to some extent. Extent, um, and I think you know there is an impact on there is ultimately an impact on on talent acquisition, which is um, which is which is really open for open for debate at the moment. But I think that any any job where you know there are patterns, there are repeatable tasks, where um, it's a very very process driven thing, then you know AI is. Um, you know, AI is coming for that. I think if you want a specific example, have a look at law firms. Um, a lot of law firms have been developing their own large language models um, to do things like uh, contract checking and translating and a lot of things that um, paralegals have traditionally done. So, you know, there's an example of an industry that's actually, um, you know, kind of already changing. So, so yeah, it's, um, yeah, there, there is there is lots of change on the way, certainly. Excellent. Um my Wi-Fi is slowing down, so I may turn off my camera, just a heads up to everybody. But before I do, one more question on this topic. Um, Matt, can you speak a little bit to, and I just had my, I just lost my, the question that I was planning to ask. Um, you know what? It'll come back to me. Um, was, it about, was it about automation or humans or something like that? It was, a, it was about the... Uh, You kind of spoke to a lot of these, uh, a lot of the questions that I written. I had a new one, but okay. it'll talk to me, Matt. Don't worry. No worries. Um, I think with the Wi-Fi slowing down, I like got a little, you know, got a little distracted. Um, but all right, let's do another. Let's quickly, if there aren't any more questions on this topic. Um, oh, I know the question. Sorry, Matt. All right. That's the, all right. What I wanted to close this topic on is is if you could share a little bit about how talent acquisition leaders, which is most of the audience here, should be thinking about preparing for the shifts that would probably come for their role. Yeah, I think it, um, there's, a, there's a number of things around this, but I think it's um, really a case of, you know, how do you plan for the future? How do you predict the future? Um, you know, they're, they're kind of key issues. So uh, I, I think the, 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 the biggest part uh, of all of this is is education in terms of learning um, the art of what's possible. Um, and I think that there are so many great resources outside of our industry around what AI is capable of. I would, I would strongly recommend that people dip into, um, you know, the podcast and the newsletters and the, the things that are out there or look at the official, um, you know, webinars and um, presentations that the likes of Microsoft and Google and Facebook do, because I think there's a lot to learn about future capabilities. So I think that's one thing. Um, I think the other thing is to have a very, very clear idea of where your current process and experience is and what the potential is to use AI and automation to make that better. And I think really understanding that is 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 part of it. Um, and then, yeah, and I think there's a there's a big bit about how you um, you know evaluate some of the the software vendors and the technologies that are that are coming into that coming into this so I think a lot of it is about really educating yourselves about the the, the future capabilities of AI what the issues are um, and really having a very strong grip on what your recruitment process your talent acquisition process currently looks like and where AI may be able to sort of drive that into the future but I think the key thing is to be proactive because um, the rest of the enterprise is looking at this and it, it, it TA really needs to keep up, otherwise it will get left behind. And as I say, will be automated against our will, which is I think the, the, the sort of the biggest threat that's out there. Yeah, it goes back to where we started this. It's, it's becoming, it's the strategic function, right? It's totally. like really explicitly leaning into the business value of talent acquisition. All right, now we have about 10 minutes for the next, te well, 20 minutes for the next two topics. They're pretty meaty um, and I'm really pumped about them because I think I get a lot of questions about this um, and I just want to like dive in with you, Matt. So the third topic is how should we, well, hold on. I'm not allowed to show the topic before the poll comes up. Um, we're going to see a poll, everybody. <laughs> what factor do you consider most important when evaluating AI technology? Potential impact on business outcomes, compatibility with existing tech, cost, implementation support, 
and other. I find this always really hard to just pick one thing. Um, all all like, of those. <laughs> right? I'm like, every can I multi-select? <laughs> Multiple choice. All right, let's see what comes up to the top. It's forcing us potential impact on business outcomes. It's coming out at the top pretty clearly. And then second is compatibility with existing technology. Cost, other, and implementation support are at the bottom. That's actually really interesting to me. Potential mm -hmm. impact on business outcomes and compatibility with existing technology. All right, now, how should we evaluate AI? How should we be evaluating AI technology? Matt, um, over to you. Yeah, I think it's a very noisy space at the moment. <clears throat> um, every single, um, you know, every every single established vendor is is coming to the table with their AI solution, um, and there are a whole host of new. Uh, you know, new vendors out there with, you know, very cool looking, very cool looking technology. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm glad that, um, you know, potential business impacts came came top because I think that is the, the most important thing. It's like thinking about technology strategically in terms of the outcome that it can give you. Um, I think there will be lots of people jumping on bad wagons because they feel they've been left out or because everyone's coming on webinars where people are telling them to get 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 you know, get with AI. Um, there could be a temptation just to jump into, um, you know, jump into the first thing that that comes along. So, the first thing to say is there is a huge amount of noise out there. So I think it's really important to have that sort of strategic base of how you look at technology in terms of how it's going to really do all of the things that were in that in that poll. So I think that's the first thing to say. I think the second thing to say is to really look at, um, you know, to really ask questions about what this AI is in this technology, because um, sometimes people are just rebranding what they've been doing for a long time as AI. Um, sometimes people are just integrating sort of existing large language models into what they're doing. Um, and sometimes people are doing some some really sort of interesting things. So I think it's understanding exactly well, what is this? What is this AI? What's the basis to it? Um, and what does it actually do? I think that's kind of important. But I, I think there's this, this other question about um, you know, which is really important from a um, from a compliance and regulatory perspective in terms of understanding, um, you know, how does the AI work here? You know, where's the mm -hmm. transparency in terms of um, how it makes decisions, what it does, how it's been programmed? I think that it's really important to ask those kind of questions to, um, you know, to, to vendors in terms of, well, what, you know, you know what what is this how does it work how does it make decisions how is it how is it how is it learning things so um yeah i think it's a it's just kind of cutting through that cutting through that noise and and also is the ai actually helping to achieve is it actually doing anything or is it just um the vendor felt they had to have ai so um mm -hmm. you know I've, i feel a bit like that on linkedin sometimes where linkedin's constantly throwing me these ai things to do that i don't think really um really kind of enhance my linkedin experience so um there's a kind of a is this just for the sake of it and does it in some ways does it detract from the the the, the core thing that 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 vendor offers so uh, again a lot of it's just down to a lot of it is down to to, to education um and you know learning about what's happening you know, in six months time, we're going to be talking about AI agents a lot, autonomous AI agents. So, um, yeah, there's kind of a lot to take in. But I think there's a, you know, a huge degree of common sense is uh, is, is, is useful, um, you know, is useful in this to kind of cut through that, cut through all that noise. Absolutely. Um, what do you think are some ethical considerations that orgs need to be mindful of when it comes to AI adoption? Yeah, it's what I said. It's where's the transparency around all of this, um, you know, and certainly um, increasingly there will be a um, an onus on the employer to understand the technology that's making employment decisions for them. Now, I think that, as I said, I'm not 100 percent sure many people are using AI for actual selection at the moment, which is where I think mm -hmm. the, the ethics really come in. But you could argue that actually, you know, in ranking candidates and finding particular, um, you know, sourcing particular people, there is that element of um, selection that's 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 going on. So I think it's really important to be uh, aware of the, I mean, there's two things here, there's ethics and there's, there's regulation. I think it's really important to be aware of what regulation actually applies to you. So, um, uh, you know, in the US, the EEOC have been putting out some great information about um, where our AI fits into the Equalities Act and things like that. 
um, in the EU. Um, the EU AI Act is is kind of quite cl quite clear what it applies to. I'm in the UK where things are a little bit more confusing, but um, we'll stick with those two examples for now. So there's the regulatory stuff around it that's really important. Um, and I think just the, the, the ethical thing is, is related to that. It's understanding that transparency. But I think actually there's a strong ethical onus on employers to provide a great candidate experience. And I think yeah. that using AI to do that is really is really important and i can see a version of the future where ai is all used to all you know to automate the recruiting process and actually make it worse and you know just make it worse for everyone and i think that um it's important to sort of put that land in this line in the sand and um use it to make things better for everyone because um without sort of proper strategy implementation it could very easily um you know go wrong and make things worse of course yeah i'm seeing some teams I'm seeing kind of a spread. So some teams are like, you know what, we're incorporating AI no matter what. We're, we're just finding ways to use it, incorporate it, because the more we get into it, we, we you know, the more we learn. Then I'm seeing teams create like, you know, AI committees, you know, where like it's like kind of like a legal function where um, the reviews are also going through an AI review. And a, you know, I think it's a really yeah, it's a really fine line because there's a right. bit about understanding the risk but there's also that genuine bit about being left behind because it's moving so quickly so it's quite a tightrope and for you know people and hr functions that's an absolute nightmare <laughs> so <Absolutely>. um, <laughs> you know again it there's a real fine line with this and i think also there's a bit about experimenting with the tools as they exist now to really understand how they work but with a view that actually a lot of the things that you do to make them work now won't be relevant in the future because they'll just work so yeah, there, yeah, there are no absolutes on this. It's really, um, it's kind of a really fine line between lots of things. One hundred percent, one hundred percent. It's a complex thing, but there is, yeah, it's, there's enough. There's, it's sort of a finding the balance is probably the key. We have Katie asking a question, Matt. Um, we're going back to the the topic around job roles. Do you believe that incorporating AI will eliminate recruiters or change their role? Um, eliminate recruiters, possibly. Change their role, definitely. Um, so I think the you know the the role is the role is going to change because there are um, you know there were just things that it, just going back to that point about all those applications coming from AI powered candidates you know we're going to have to change the way that we write interview questions the way that you know that, so that that is driving change in the role even if nothing else nothing else does um, <clears throat> will AI eliminate recruiters I mean it's the there are several viewpoints on this there's an extreme viewpoint that says there won't be any recruiters by this time next year. There's another viewpoint that says no, no change. You can't possibly um, make what we do. A machine can't do what we do. Um, I think the answer is probably towards the um, more towards the kind of extreme em elimination view, if that makes sense. I think that um, I don't think it will eliminate recruiters, but it will fundamentally change the makeup of what a talent acquisition team looks like so um you know i think we'll still see recognizable recruiters but i think we'll also see things like um data specialist experience design um professionals and you know lots of different things so i think it's a much changed future um it's very difficult to deal in absolutes around it um personally i don't think that it will eliminate recruiters wholesale i think that's a a bit of a sensationalist um viewpoint that doesn't really stand up to scrutiny however i do think it's going to drive some massive changes that are going to affect everyone right right all right now we got a meaty topic coming up at the end um and it is based off of your most recent white paper which i mentioned a little bit earlier on the 10 ways that ai will transform talent acquisition um, in it, you outline the strong forces likely to drive adoption of AI this year. Um, this is kind of what the meat of this last section is. I, I would love it if you could spend a little bit of time walking us through those forces. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, I think in terms of the... Um, in terms of the... I think I think that's the important thing. I think it's important to 
to understand what is driving what is driving change, what is driving change here. Um, and I think that there are there are three the three things I identify in the white paper. There's more, but these are probably the most significant significant things. Um, so the first one is is actually about skills. It's um, skill shortages sure. that we currently got, but also shortening skills. The fact that skills are going out of date so quickly, um, and if you're recruiting someone because they've got certain skills, will that be relevant to their career in sort of six to 12 months time? So I think the the whole discussion about skills and how we hire people is, is, is really shaping is really shaping this. Um, I think the other thing is productivity. So um, with the, the kind of the economic situation um, as it is in many parts of the world, there are obviously differences, but um, growth is certainly not as high as um, it has been in the past. Um, Organisations like McKinsey's have been putting out putting out research that suggests that for companies to you know, get gain value, they have to be more product. They have to they have to drive productivity. Um, a lot of that is about looking at talent in a different way, but also a lot about that. A lot of that is about automation and, and being process driven, so, uh, uh, process efficiency. Um, so I think that there's a lot of um, push down in organisations coming from um, the C suite trying to see how their their organisation can be more productive, and that's got implications for talent acquisition. Um, and then the, I think the third one is that changing that changing candidate behaviour um, that we've just sort of discussed at length. And I think AI sort of pulls all of these all of these together. And I think that if you add in the kind of the rapid development of the technology, all those things together are going to drive this forward, drive this forward really quickly. Um, and you know they're not necessarily forces that are kind of within our control. Those are three really big themes that we're seeing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And it's that's why this is such an interesting time. It's not just about the technology. Um, it's about everything else that's kind of, you know, converging, converging at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. And they underscore, I think, everything that you already mentioned, we've talked a little bit about. Um, and they're touching every sort of like level of the TA, um, the talent acquisition ecosystem. Um, I, we mentioned, you know, I, I mentioned this white paper because I thought it was really interesting. I also think that like, we could spend an entire webinar talking about this. <laughs> we could have probably yeah. spent the whole webinar talking about each of these subjects, but. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a big topic. We're flying yeah. through it, Matt. I'm Dominican. I talk fast. We do it. Um, <laughs> um, but I do, I would like it if you could, you mentioned 10 things, if you could mention two or three of those kind of your top kind of like hey I, I feel terrible telling you to tell me your top three of your top 10 but you know. <laughs> no that's fine that's fine um well I, I try and pull them together I think the first the first um the, the first sort of two or three things look at um the data that's available so the ability to have kind of real-time talent intelligence to, to understand um the internal skills market and the external skills market in real time because of the way that AI can can um, understand the data that has a real impact in terms of how we think about workforce planning, for example. So I think that workforce planning can be much more predictive because it's got those, um, those inputs, which means that companies can sort of move a lot faster um, in that planning cycle and be much more adaptive. Um, so I think that's, that's one area that impacts talent acquisition. Um, coming off that, you know, pooling, creating dynamic talent pools. So almost predicting, if you can predict where the skills, what skills you'll need and when you need them and whether you have them internally or externally, you can then create, um, you know, talent pools of, um, you know, potential people to to do that. Um, so that's that's another aspect of it. Um, and likewise, as that moves out into talent, talent attraction, there are lots of interesting things that can be optimized and automated in, in talent attraction. Um, the other, the other, the other pieces are really things that we've talked about already. So that process automation, um, which is inevitable. Um, I think the biggest thing for me is the personalized experience. So the ability to give people a personalized experience at scale um, uh, is just a phenomenal opportunity to fix so many issues that we've had with the candidate experience and um, and everything um, every, everything else. So um, I think that's another one. Um, onboarding, which we kind of already touched on um, the ability to kind of start that much earlier to make that much more personalized to make that tailored to someone's um, you know someone's skills and really understanding where they are where they need to be because you've got all this dynamic workforce planning information you've got all this information about um, about the individuals um, and I think the 
potentially the great part of this is to be able to offer people a real sort of personalized career path within you know within the organization to really understand where they are where they need to be to put that against the projects and tasks that are coming in i think there's a real sort of um revolution happening there and i think you'll notice from a lot of these things these aren't solely talent acquisition things they're uh you know talent management learning and development and i think that uh, we're going to see a lot more collaboration, cooperation, or even merging between between those functions, and, and AI is going to facilitate that. Which which kind of brings to the final point, which is uh, basically a much more strategic focus for talent acquisition. So really understanding um, where it fits into the where it fits into the business, um, and also its role in things like workforce planning and talent development. I think that's a really um, exciting opportunity. We talked about roles changing, um, and I think that's the that that could be an immensely positive one. Awesome. Um, I I want to just kind of touch base a little bit on that personalization that you, comment that you made about how it's the most important thing that you that you're seeing. It threads. It's a thread throughout your entire um, sort of positioning on this, um, and I don't actually hear it that often in practice. So when I'm talking to TA leaders, we talk about personalization, but I don't actually see it in practice. And you mentioned onboarding, you mentioned anything else that you want to like, how do you want to encourage teams to like lean into this and to lean into um, that person? Can you paint a bigger picture, I guess, or a deeper yeah, picture? Yeah, it doesn't get talked about in practice because it's not something that uh, TA has, has ever really done with the technology that it's had. Um, I think that's the, that's the first thing to say. I think if you look at, um, other areas of sales. And if you look at sales and marketing, for example, you'll see a lot of the kind of personalization that I'm that I'm that I'm talking that I'm talking about already happening. So I think there's an element of educating ourselves in the in the art of the possible. Um, I think a lot of it is around this this element of experience design. How do you take this technology and how do you use it? Um, to design a great experience for for someone and give them that that personalization, um, I think it's not really discussed because we're not quite there yet. But to me, I think this is a massive theme for the future because um, this is what this facilitates. And if AI is going to take away, you know, some of the role of recruiters and some of that sort of the, the humanness in the recruiting process, we need to put that back somehow. And I think. Um, personalization for me is the one is the one to watch. I think it's the, the the one of the biggest trends in in all of this. So you know, take a look what happens in marketing. Take a look what happens in sales. What's currently possible, um, and I think that's a good a, a good kind of focus for the future. Absolutely. I was going to ask you as, as our last sort of closing question on this topic. Um, what are you most looking forward to when it comes to AI related to TA? It sounds like it's personalization. Is that a good guess, or is there something else? Yeah, I think so. Um, I created this other, this other. Um, uh, I kind of wrote a post on LinkedIn a, a few weeks ago about recruiting Nirvana. That actually, um, you could take a very positive view of all of this and say, actually, um, we could well get to the point where um, people get the right job for them at the right time in the right company, um, and you know, we we kind of reach that sort of that recruiting nirvana that um, you know we were perhaps been able to deliver on an individual le level sometimes, but um, you know, not at scale. Um, there's a flip side to it as well, which is the <laughs> recruiting dystopia. So I would just be very optimistic that I think it would make it could make recruiting, uh, you know, so much better, so much faster, so much relevant, so much more relevant. You know, give companies the skills they need when they need them, but perhaps more importantly, really help people with their careers and just things like facilitating the ability to move from one industry to the other really easily because there's a real understanding of the the way that skills cross over um you know changing you know th that kind of thing i think that uh you know we're not very good at at the moment i think that's what technology can 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 really facilitate so um yeah i'd be really looking forward to, to that element of it oh brilliant recruiting nirvana i love it i love it um Matt, I really do want you to share a little bit about your upcoming course because some of this is all about just continuing to learn. You have people who have 614 episodes of the Recruiting Future podcast they can listen to. And, Absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah. Or you can join this co this course, but I'll pass it over to you, Matt. Yeah, I put this together. I put, really put this to get together on the back of everything that's that, that's happening. And it kind of really struck me that there's so much confusing information out there 
uh, you know, people are a real sort of pivot point with their careers in, in terms of well, what's going to happen. And there's a real danger that talent acquisition could just be overrun by, um, you know, by, by, you know, by senior management or other departments. And we don't quite get to that recruiting nirvana that we all want. So um, I, I've kind of put this course together. It's based on um, it's based on some tools taken from strategic foresight, which is the sort of the academic study of the future. Um, and it's used in strategic planning. So really the idea is to give people some simple models to help them um, really plan and predict what the future might look like for them and their organization when it comes to AI and skills and all these sort of things, um, and therefore be able to be proactive and actually influence the future and have those conversations within their organization. And there's lots of um, tools and methodologies and things in there um, to really help people to really help people do that. Um, and that's kind of why I put it together because I think it's a, just a really important thing to have. And I think that there are, um, you know, there are lots of tools and techniques that we don't use um, in, in, in our industry that, that, that we could. Um, it also contains a huge amount about forces driving change and a lot of the information that we've, um, that we've talked about as well. So um, it, it's really, I really put it together to help people. Um, it's about three hours of content split into nine lessons. So it's not, um, I've kind of designed it to sort of split into, fit into people's very busy, um, very busy, busy schedules. But um, really, it's to kind of empower you to, uh, you know, properly plan for the future by helping to, helping to influence it. Brilliant. Um, it's very exciting. I looked into it. It's really um, insightful, just like this conversation, Matt. Um, I feel so lucky I got to interview the interviewer. So <laughs> it's always nice to be it's always nice to be answering the questions rather than yeah. asking them for, for a change. Yeah. Oh no, I prefer to be on this side all day. <laughs> um, Matt, this was wonderful. Thank you so, so, so much uh, for joining us today. Thank you to everyone in our audience for jumping in here. What a delightful conversation. I've been looking forward to this one um, since it got on our calendar. So thank you so much, Matt. Um, you will all receive a recorded copy of the webinar shortly, um, a recap blog from our team member, Alexa. Um, mark your calendars for our next webinar, June 26th, with Trent Cotton, VP of Talent, Acquisition, Talent and Culture at Hatchworks. We'll be digging into all things talent metrics. So we're going to get into the weeds on the numbers. Uh, thanks again, everybody. Have a great rest of your week. Thank you for being here with us this morning. Um, that's it, Matt. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. And thank you for, for thank you for listening, everyone. Of course. Great seeing you. Bye, everybody.